What we are going to do right here, right now, is take a look at an extremely simplified version of a DC to three-phase AC converter or inverter, since these power electronics devices are central to the operation of both these devices. As implied by its title, a DC to three-phase AC converter or inverter takes DC input and changes it to three-phase AC output with variable magnitude and frequency. One way of modeling a simple DC to AC converter is a DC source using a collection of six switches, Q1 through Q6. This model, by the way, is a simplification. These switches are not electromechanical in nature, but rather semiconductor devices known as transistors with no moving parts that can open and close astonishingly quickly. I should additionally note that alternate numbering formats are sometimes used to designate a specific switch. No, my numbering sequence goes one, two, three for the top positive switches, four, five, six from the bottom negative switches, left to right, top to bottom, as normal people read a normal book. As an extreme simplification, a transistor closes, as would an extremely fast electromechanical switch when it receives a specific control voltage value and opens just as fast when that control voltage is not applied. Consider the stator windings U, V, and W of a brushless DC motor wired in Y configuration such that windings U and V are between converter outputs A and B, windings V and W are between outputs B and C, and finally windings W and U are between outputs C and A. Given this arrangement, consider this six-stage sequence of operation as the six switches sequentially chain states such that only two are simultaneously closed at any time. When Q1 and Q5 are closed, DC voltage is applied across windings U to V positive to negative such that current travels into U and out of V. In a balanced configuration, windings U, V, and W present identical impedance such that a pair of energized windings each drops half the applied voltage. Only in the case of winding V, since current is coming out of it, it does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding W. When Q1 and Q6 are closed, DC voltage is applied across windings U and W positive to negative, such that current travels into U and out of W. Winding U drops half the applied voltage, as does winding W, only does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding V. When Q2 and Q6 are closed, DC voltage is applied across windings V and W, positive to negative, such that current travels into V and out of W. Winding V drops half the applied voltage, as does W, only it does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding U. When Q2 and Q4 are closed, DC voltage is applied across windings V and U, positive to negative, such that current travels into V and out of U. Winding V drops half the applied voltage, as does U, only it does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding W. When Q3 and Q4 close, DC voltage is applied across windings W and U, positive to negative, so that the current travels into W and out of U. Winding W drops half the applied voltage, as does U, only it does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding V. Finally, when Q3 and Q5 close, DC voltage is applied across windings W and V, positive to negative, so that the current travels into W and out of V. Winding W drops half the applied voltage, as does V, only it does so with negative polarity. During this stage, no voltage appears across winding U. The sequence then repeats itself. You will note the resultant polarity of outputs U and V oscillates, and they do so such that they are offset from one another by a relative 120 degrees. Three phases, six steps with a 120 degree relative phase shift. For this reason, this control method is called three phase, six step, 120 degree modulation. You wonder how they come up with these titles. Consider what happens when these waveforms are applied to a stator with one pole pair per phase physically displaced from one another by 120 degrees, or if you prefer, two poles per phase or in at 60 degree increments. Let's watch this six step sequence in action. Step one, positive U, negative V. The two magnetic fields combine and establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 330 degrees. Step 2. Positive U, negative W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 30 degrees. Step 3. 
positive V, negative W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 90 degrees. Step four, negative U, positive V. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 150 degrees. Step five, negative U, positive W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 210 degrees. Finally, step six, negative V, positive W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 270 degrees. The sequence then repeats itself. 330, 30, 90, 150, 210, 270. Now just put a permanent magnet rotor in the center. As the rotating magnetic field circles around and around the stator, the permanent magnet rotor is simultaneously attracted by opposite poles and repelled by like poles such that it locks in or rotates synchronously with the stator. Want to reverse the direction? You can always apply this pulse sequence in reverse. Let's take a look at this. Here's the switching sequence in reverse. When Q3 and Q5, they establish negative voltage at V and positive voltage at W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented around 270 degrees. When Q3 and Q4 close, it establishes negative voltage at U and positive voltage at W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 210 degrees. When Q2 and Q4 closes, it establishes negative voltage at U and positive voltage at V. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 150 degrees. When Q2 and Q6 closes, it establishes positive voltage at V and negative voltage at W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 90 degrees. The closure of Q1 and Q6 establishes positive voltage at U and negative voltage at W. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field at around 30 degrees. Find that the closure of Q1 and Q5 establishes positive voltage at U and negative voltage at V. The stator establishes a unified magnetic field oriented at around 330 degrees. The sequence then repeats itself. See what happened? The stator rotating magnetic field continued to rotate, only it did so in the opposite direction. Perhaps the obvious implication of this fact is comparing and contrasting how one reverses the rotational direction of a traditional DC motor. Viewers will recall one reverses the rotational direction of a traditional DC motor by swapping the polarity applied to the armature. This configuration, in contrast, uses a DC source of fixed polarity, and instead of swapping polarity, the power electronics components simply change the switching sequence, thus the rotational direction of the stator magnetic field. This is essentially equivalent to swapping two of the applied phase sequences for a three-phase AC motor. If we continue examining the rotating magnetic field of the stator, we can find other similarities with three-phase AC. What if we wanted to speed this rotor up? We could open and close the switches faster. This would be equivalent to increasing the excitation frequency, thus the synchronous speed for a three-phase AC motor. What if we want to slow this rotor down? We could open and close the switches slower. This would be equivalent to decreasing the excitation frequency, thus the synchronous speed for a three-phase AC motor. Simple, right? Not really. This is the simplest of simplifications that I'll soon expand upon, but it gets the general point across. One of the upfront problems with this simplification is inductance. Motor windings aren't purely resistive in nature, but rather a mix of resistive and inductive components and also include rotational speed dependent counter electromotive force opposing applied voltage. Viewers will recall that inductors are magnetic energy storage elements, but we can't expect the applications of these perfectly rectangular voltage pulses to result in perfectly matching rectangular pulses of current due to the storage and subsequent release of magnetic energy in the inductive portions of the windings. Long story short, in the real world, your oscilloscope traces won't look nearly as pretty as this simplification suggests, but they should still exhibit a recognizable phase shift characteristic of three-phase AC. Second problem with this simplification also relates to inductance. View will recall an inductor presents a frequency-dependent complex impedance to AC voltage. Z sub L equals 2 pi FL. Perhaps you've heard of this. At low excitation frequencies, inductors present low impedance, can draw large amounts of current. Conversely, at high excitation frequencies, inductors present high impedance and draw small amounts of current. To keep current manageable at different excitation frequencies, we can't use a fixed DC source, but either one that can step up or step down voltage as a function of excitation frequency. For this reason, a brushless DC motor employing three-phase, six-step, 120-degree modulation needs to make use of a variable DC source, and something known as volts per hertz control. 
Similar to a traditional motor drive, volts per hertz control with a brushless DC motor applies low voltage at low frequencies when inductive impedance is low and applies increasingly larger voltage at higher frequencies when inductive impedance increases. This relatively linear pairing of voltage magnitude and excitation frequency keeps current manageable. For example, consider a brushless DC motor operating a primary frequency of 30 hertz at 15 volts, such that the standard windings draw two amps of current. At increased excitation frequency of 60 hertz, the inductive impedance of the standard windings doubles, such that at 30 volts, the windings still draw only two amps of current. At an even higher excitation frequency of 120 hertz, the inductive impedance of the stator windings again doubles, such that at 60 volts, the stator windings still only draw two amps of current. Long story short, three phase, six step, 120 degree modulation can't use a fixed DC source if you want to keep current manageable and must employ a variable voltage source using volts per hertz control. Lastly, the third and final problem with this simplification is straight up physics. Three phase, six step, 120 degree modulation is the dumbest kind of a control because the rotor is prone to losing synchronization if accelerated or decelerated too quickly or if it experiences a sudden increase or decrease in oppositional torque. An apt analogy I might use would be the act of leading a donkey to some desired location using a carrot on a string, something I'm sure we've all had the occasion to do. If the carrot is too close to the donkey, the donkey eats it and stops moving. If the carrot's too far away, the donkey isn't interested and doesn't move. The only way the donkey ever moves is if the carrot's just out of reach, but not so far out of reach as to not engage his interest. The earlier model we employed assumes the stator and rotor magnetic fields lock together, and the rotor moves in stepwise increments from one location to the next as the rotating magnetic field progressively moves around and around the stator. In reality, the stator magnetic field kind of needs to act like the carrot to the rotor's donkey i.e. the stator needs to be just in front of the rotor to get the rotor to move. If the stator ever gets too far ahead or too far behind, the rotor loses synchronization. If they ever align, the rotor stops. A graph of torque as a function of rotor and stator field displacement demonstrates maximal torque is achieved at positive or negative 90 degrees for a single pole pair per phase stator. This implies a permanent magnet motor only operates effectively if it knows where the rotor is at and can act on this positional data to apply a proper signal to the stator to ensure torque remains at or near maximum. I say again, since this is important, a permanent magnet motor only operates effectively if it knows where the rotor is at and can act on this positional data to apply the proper signal to the stator to ensure torque remains at or near maximum. These observations about varying voltage magnitude and rotational position data suggest changes can be made to our simple model to increase the performance of the system. Let's deal with rotational position first. One way of positively identifying rotor position is using a shaft encoder. With knowledge of the present rotor position, the most ideal location for the next stator position can be calculated since the rotor doesn't lose synchronization and torque remains at an optimal maximum. A simple shaft encoder might employ three Hall effect sensors, U, V, and W, mounted at different locations around the stator. Yes, with 23 remaining letters of the alphabet, you'd think they use something different than the same three letters they use for the stator windings, but they don't. In this example, we're assuming a Hall effect sensor registers a logical one or true if it detects north, and a logical zero or false if it detects the south. The logical status of these sensors give coarse positional data within a range of six 60 degree segments. More sophisticated higher resolution implementations would divide the rotor into smaller angular segments. With the rotor pointed straight up and down, U registers zero, V registers zero, and W registers one, making this position from 330 degrees to 30 degrees, UVW001. For those with the background of digital systems, you'll note it is simply by sheer coincidence that binary number 001 happens to equal the decimal number one. This is not true for the remaining steps. If the rotor is between 30 degrees and 90 degrees, none of the sensors detect north, making this position UVW000. Let's call this step two. If the rotor is between 90 and 150, the sensors register this position as UVW100. Let's call this step three. If the rotor is between 150 and 210, the sensors register this as position UVW110. Let's call this step four. 
If the rotor is between 210 degrees and 270 degrees, the sensors registered this position as UVW111. Let's call this step five. And finally, if the rotor is between 270 degrees and 330 degrees, the sensors register this as position UVW011. Let's call this step six. In summary, clockwise rotation of the rotor from top dead center at 001 yields the following sequence of positional data for UVW from step one to six. Step one at 001, step two at 000, step three at 100, step four at 110, step five at 111, step six at 011, and then back to step one at 001. Conversely, counterclockwise rotation of the rotor from top dead center at 001 yields the following sequence of positional data, UVW. Step one at 001, step six at 011, step five at 111, step four at 110, step three at 100, step two at 000, and back to step one at 001. Those viewers with a background in digital logic and binary numbers will additionally know elements of the gray code in this implementation. Specifically, any single step positional change results in only one digit changing state. For example, the single step movement from step one at 001 to step two at 000 results in only one digit, in this case W, changing states. Similarly, the single step positional change from let's say 000 to 100 results in only one digit, in this case U, changing states. Single digit transitions indicates ideal expected operation. Anytime two digits change, let's say the radical two position jump from 100 to 111 will both V and W change states, or perhaps the complete 180 degree reversal from 100 to 011 where all three digits change states, you know you got a problem. Additionally, you note there is never a scenario that will result in the nonsense positions 010 or 101. These positions and radical jumps represent error states and unexpected operation.